I grew up in a coastal town, Whakatane, on the east coast of the North Island, New Zealand. And at the age of 12, my father threw me into a P-class yacht and I learned to sail for the first time. At the same time, my eldest brother, Kerry, purchased a yacht of his own and set off from Darwin up into Southeast Asia with his friend, Stuart Glass, and Kerry's girlfriend. Back then, there was no social media. You know, communication was very difficult, certainly not phone calls. And the staple was letters, and Kerry wrote the most amazing letters. And my dad would read the letters around the kitchen table together, and we lived vicariously by Kerry's adventures. And it kind of planted a seed in my mind at that time that one day, I too would go sailing the seven seas, have adventures similar to my brother. And I have. Back in 2014, Rachel and I bought this yacht and five years ago we set sail permanent liverboards and have been documenting our journey on our YouTube channel, The Cruising Kiwis. For the last five months, we've been following Kerry's journey up through Southeast Asia. Now we had hoped to sail to Cambodia, but for a variety of reasons, the main one being we just, the timing did not work for our eldest son, Finn, who is back in New Zealand following his Olympic dream, which he's on target to do for Paris next year. <laughs> if you wish to follow us there, that would be great. You know, very proud of what he's doing. But he only had two weeks off and the timing fitted for us only if we flew there. I was 14 years old when those beautiful letters from Kerry stopped. Time passed and we had no idea what had happened to Kerry and his crew. My father wrote letters all around Southeast Asia, ports, looking for any information, contacting friends, other sailors, nothing. We had no idea. We heard the devastating news. 16 months later, Kerry had been captured by the Khmer Rouge, taken prisoner back to Tulsling Prison, where he and a charter, an Englishman, John Dewhurst, were tortured for two months, uh, were forced to sign confessions to being CIA, and were then executed. I have been to Cambodia before, back in 2009. I was very privileged to be invited to testify at the War Crimes Tribunal in Phnom Penh and take the stand against Comrade Doik, the man who oversaw my brother's interrogation and subsequent murder. Doik. At times I've wanted to smash you, to use your words, in the same way that you smashed so many others. At times I've imagined you shackled, starved, whipped, and clubbed viciously. Viciously! I have wanted you to suffer the way that you made Kerry and so many others. However, while well, part of me has a desire to feel that way, I am trying to let go. And this process is part of that. I have anxiety about bringing the whole family along on this journey. Is it the right thing to do? Is it going to dredge up bad stuff for the kids? I don't know. But I think it will be a very positive journey for us all. Time will tell. So guys, just wondering, we're about to head down to pick up the tuk-tuk to get to the prison. Tulsling. Yeah. How are you? What are you feeling? Have you? What are your thoughts? Uh, nothing at the moment, really. <laughs> I'm sure on the way there I'll probably be a bit more, I don't know, we made it kind of thing, especially once we're there, you know. Yeah. This is pretty much, you know, very been in the planning for how long now? Six months plus, like being a reality kind of idea. Yeah. Had it since day one, but now that it, since Darwin it was kind of a reality that we could be doing this. I, I didn't think we were going till tomorrow, so it's kind of like I wasn't yeah. expecting that we are going now. Yeah. But, um, I don't know, it's kind of like the main reason I came over here, right? I mean, so to check all this stuff out because I've obviously been here before and yeah, did it all together. So 
kind of hasn't really sunk in yet that we're going now. Well, look, when I was in there, I was numb. I wasn't, it didn't really hit me for quite some time I was in there. So, you know, it's understandable. Yeah, no, it just doesn't feel right because it's just kind of plonk. Well, I guess because people have built up around it now, but it's kind of just plonked in the middle of the street. And, you know, in Germany, the concentration camps, they were, like, built out from the city, you know, all built up, kind of specially made for, you know. But this just kind of seems too casual for it to be here. It's just another building. Yeah, part of that reason for that is because the city was evacuated and this was actually formerly a school that was converted into a torture and murder chamber. So hence that's why it's in the middle of the city. It was a school. And believe it or not, Comrade Doik was a former teacher. Go figure. As soon as you enter Tulsling prison, your fate was sealed. You'd be immediately photographed, put in a cell, tortured, and then told to write a series of ever wilder confessions, proving that you were an enemy of the Pol Pot regime. Deutsch's job was not to find guilt or innocence through a process of confession. Confession was just another mark that he needed completed as part of a process by which somebody would end up dead. Language in Khmer and English. Mm, yes. <coughs> Declaration of Kerry George Hamill on October the 13th, 1978, working under the orders of Commandant oh, Michael, Michael Leibowitz. Oh, yes, Michael Leibowitz. That was a name that was in one of his confessions. Oh. Michael Leibowitz was you know one of his commanders. No. See, that's, that was from one of the confessions that has gone missing, but maybe it's in here. Maybe. So this is the Khmer version. This was all typed out. We actually, when we did the film, we interviewed a typist, because they had set up typists in different rooms where the interrogation was taking place. It was the typist who said that the uh, prisoners, when they were brought into interrogation, most of them very quickly confessed to their crimes, to being enemies of the state of Cambodia. And of course, none of them were enemies of the state. I don't believe any of them probably were. And he said that sometimes some resistance said, no, I'm innocent, I've done nothing wrong. But after a little bit of um, interrogation, they very quickly changed their point of view and became enemies of the state. And of course, after they admitted to being CIA or internal operatives, they then were asked to name the people they worked with. And they wanted sometimes 10 or 20 names. So these people would then, first of all, they would name people they didn't like, <laughs> perhaps in their village, people they had disputes with. And often these people were family members, cousins, uncles, aunts, siblings. So they would then be brought in for interrogation and asked for a list of names. And so it went on. And this became the Khmer Rouge effectively destroyed there. Mm. And it's called democide, not genocide. Democide, domestic genocide. We were politely asked by the Documentation Centre to refrain from filming Kerry's confession. However, when Rob visited Tolsling Prison in 2009, he was followed by a film crew to make the award-winning documentary Brother No. 1 about his journey to the War Crimes Tribunal. Kerry's confession is an extraordinary document. Despite being held against his will, being starved and tortured, he managed to keep a sense of humour determined to have the last word. This is it. This is Kerry's um, confession, taken under duress. You know, there's a lot of humour here, and can you believe he's, try he's just trying to have some fun? I enrolled in the Psychology for Intelligence Officers course. This was taught by an American CIA intelligence officer, Major Roos. The Roos, of course, being a, a con, A course on covers for intelligence officers was given by Colonel Sanders, um, 
<laughs> which is obviously under duress, Kerry was retaining some sort of sense of humour. Viktor Frankl, who was a survivor from the Holocaust, wrote that, you know, forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess, um, except for one thing, the freedom to choose how you will respond to that situation. And for me, Kerry responded with the most incredible courage and strength. The public speaking course was compulsory for all the second year students. This was taught by Mr. S. Tarr of the Carnegie Institute. Tarr was the head of the CIA office in Hamilton. He held the rank of captain. And S. Tarr, of course, is my mum, Esther. She was a lovely speaker and she had this lovely Irish lilt that, um, yeah, you know, it was a message to my mum. It was a message to my mum. I've just listened to the testimony I gave or some of it. Oh man, talking about my mother. It's just all, it's just a heart wrenching. It really is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so emotional. Mm. I listened to that one too. <laughs> Oh, it's beautiful, just what my brother was doing at the time, the thinking at the time, you know. <laughs> it's incredible, you know, to have that wherewithal. To, you know, talk about mum. And um, he was taking the piss. <laughs> he was taking the piss. He must have been chuckling to himself, you know, while he was writing this stuff. <laughs> so proud. So proud. As you will be well aware, Your Honours, in every family, everyone is interconnected. A family shares in happiness and warmth. A family shares in depression and misery. My family's disintegration is my disintegration. I would like to describe how my family struggled and perhaps failed to cope with my brother's death. With your leave, Mr President, I would like to begin by telling you about my brother John. The loss of his closest sibling had a massive impact on John. Eight months after he found out what had happened to my eldest brother, Kerry, he threw himself off a cliff near our family home. My father, Miles, and my third brother, Peter, retraced his footsteps to the edge of the cliff and saw his body at the bottom of the rocks. He and Kerry were so close. There was only 18 months between them. Kerry would have been called a sensitive new age guy, whereas John was Rolling Stones, you know, Neil Young. But that difference also was a good thing too. I mean, I can't help but think of them together, actually. Kerry dying. John, six months after we had the memorial for Kerry. Doik. When you killed my brother Kerry, you killed my brother John as well. Our visit to Phnom Penh wasn't all sadness. We actually enjoyed Cambodia immensely. It was the catalyst for deep discussion. Finn was keeping up his rowing. We had a much needed checkup at the dentist and the boys were loving the counterfeit watches for sale at the market. All these big watch brands, Rolex, Patek Philippe, charging hundreds of thousands of dollars for their watches. And I can buy the exact same thing here for like 50 bucks. It's crazy. Yeah, daylight robbery, I tell you. And it really bugs me when people come in here and try and like barter and get the price down when it's already so cheap. It's just like, man. <sighs> I'll, um, I'll give you 20 for it. And a chance meeting with a Northern Irish couple whilst out at dinner 
also led us to a positive venture that is bringing hope to some of the vulnerable children in the nation's capital. So we've been given no indication of where this village is. We don't know the name of it to protect the children so that we can't repeat the name so that they can't be found. It's an eye opener really. I mean the way they live, the houses they're living in, it's just incredible. It's such poverty. But such beautiful smiles from the children. The children are either exploited to some degree or at serious risk of exploitation. Those are two main criteria for us selecting them. That can be families that are trying to get out of poverty, that are trapped, that they have nobody to look after the children, so they end up actually having to neglect the children to try and go and earn a living, or the family's completely dysfunctional. They drink drugs, gambling, whatever, the kind of nasty stuff that you find in any very, very poor environment. Um, one of the other potential exploitation issues obviously is sexual one. Um, most people are aware that there's a, a bad uh, publicity story around Cambodia and child sex abuse. Now the government have made huge strides in that, particularly over the last 5, 10, 15 years. Um, but it is still there in lower um, incidences that would have been. And part of the big danger is that it's still perceived that way in paedophile circles in the West. So you will still get Westerners coming here looking for children, even if they aren't able to get them. And you're very particular about what we film and don't film? Yes, uh, we have to be careful. Um, again, a lot of those uh, paedophiles are predatory, mm. so they trophy hunt. They, they, if, they, if they can identify a specific child, location, name, they will try and seek that, that, that individual out. So uh, we don't mind photos, we don't mind videos, we just need to be very careful about what's in them and what gets posted yeah. uh, so that things are not identifiable like a child or a location or yeah. whatever to try. The last thing we want to do is put a child at increased risk. Yeah. We're yeah. here to really be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Can we name the chair? Yes, uh, in, the, in the West, the, the website is eggshellcambodia.com, all yep. one word, eggshellcambodia.com. Okay, brilliant. One of the stories they have told us is about they all wear a school uniform mm. and even for the little ones it gives them a sense of I'm somebody important, I have a uniform. They graduate at five, hopefully into a primary school and then into a secondary school, that doesn't always happen, but at least they're getting that foundation and hopefully from there they can soar because not everybody gets the preschool education here so they arrive at their primary school and they already know their numbers, they already know some letters, so they feel good about who they are. They've got their uniform, they know a little bit, put them on the ladder. He was just saying to me, here's yeah. a civil party for yeah. case two. I was in case one, I testified. So this man survived uh, the killing fields. And um, and I'm sure he's lost a lot of family members. And this is his book. Yeah. Some, some Rithi? Some Rithi. Some Rithi. Yeah. Surviving the genocide in the land of Anchor. Yeah. And Anchor was the all seeing eye of the Khmer Rouge, of Pol Pot's regime. Everyone obeyed what Anchor said. Anchor was always right. Anchor was never wrong. So if you were arrested, it was because you were guilty. Not because you had been tried, not because you had been stood before a court or a jury or a judge. It was because Anchor said you were guilty. And so those people died. You have some injuries on your hands. Can you explain to me what happened? Uh, one day, uh, when he was carrying a, a big pan of porridge here with a one of the guard, and he just feel a bit um, unconscious, and his body had been fallen into the, the, the pan. Collapsed? Yeah, collapsed into the pan and got burned uh, on his body and oh. his head. Oh, wow. Uh, there's no medicine. There was no medicine, so he used um, motorbike white, you know, to
to, to clean it, okay. to, to, to apply on, on his wound. But he's not sure how many months that um, the, the wound get uh, healed. Okay. I understand the reason he was not killed was because he could fix things, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, how long was he in prison for? So he was sent to prison since 1977 okay. until the, the Vietnamese army yes. uh, entered and then he free. So at least one and a half, maybe two years. Almost, almost two years, yes. Yes, actually uh, there was many things many that uh, yeah, I mean, that he can't forget. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first thing was forced labor, yeah. that he had been forced to work for a long hour. Yeah. And he also remember when he had been hit on the back of his head. Right. Luckily he not died. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. Uh, so far there were only two, pers two, two guys. One of the men he also lived in Simbri of that Hawaii uh -huh. with him. He was asked to make fertilizer from human waste and he was to mix it with plant matter. Can you ask him what the guard asked him to do? Actually, uh, the human fertilizer, the first they cremated the body. And then they take the ashes from the human body, yeah. uh, also with some piece of bone they have not been oh. burned all yet, and well, yeah, mix until it's completely uh, mm -hmm. like powder. Yeah. Yeah. And then they yeah. also mix with um, uh, human seed, animal seed, yeah. uh, kind of muddy put together. Yeah. And then you take um, the plant to, yes. to mm -hmm. put with them and plant on, on the ground. Father, he was working to to make a, the human fertilizer. One guy said to him to test it, to, yes. to eat the, the, their seeds. Yeah. The, and he also immediately realized that if he said no, he would be shot. Yeah. Him used the same victim, but he was been directed with a victim, yes. And he really a thing for your coming and for you are sharing his story to the world and he also want you, and you know, to be friends or, or like not friend family brother and brother, brother and brother yeah yeah yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. yeah. Oh, yeah I, I need more brothers in my life yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey bro in new zealand we say cheer bro cheer bro, bro. Cheer, bro. <laughs> thanks mate good to meet you it's been so nice Thank you. 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 So today we're visiting Chung Ek, the Killing Fields, about 10 kilometers outside of Phnom Penh. The unwanted prisoners who had been uh, good enough to sign a confession or were just female or a child and unnecessary to anchor were brought here for their execution. They were brought by truck. In the beginning the trucks only came once or twice a month but by 1978 trucks were arriving every day sometimes up to 300 people on board. Being anchor it was very secretive and they would only do this at night time. They would be brought here their names would be written down, they would kneel beside a pit, be hit over the head with a bow or a club and fall into the pit. นั่นแต่บ่าขอสมุดสมุยน่ะสมุดนั้นเหล่งไว้ก็ 
because it isn't ordered, he said that it isn't ordered um, to cover the body, not to be seen. So the next day it made it look like nothing happened. So the last time I was here, what's that, 12, 13, 13 years ago, wow. Um, these boardwalks were not here and we were literally walking on the graves and there was fragments of bone and clothing coming through and actually it was very difficult to avoid stepping on them. It felt very disrespectful so I kind of like what they've done now. What happens in the, in the rainy season, more of this material comes through and my understanding is now they sometimes clear it away, some of the clothing in particular. And I have to say we're coming up to the part that I'm dreading because it is possibly the worst place uh, of this entire regime's representative of what this regime did to humanity. Uh, it's called the killing tree and it's how they dispatched children and babies. What do you think? <laughs> I'm quite moved. <laughs> one particular picture of a little boy or girl at uh, Tolstoy Prison. There's a lot of children photographed there, but mainly there. Um, the mugshot ones are of five, six-year-olds, and then amongst them is this tiny little, maybe one-year-old, just looking out so innocent. Crazy. God, the, um, the thing about the music, like they had music playing when they would uh, kill people so that no one could hear what they were doing, like couldn't hear the screams and stuff. And that killing tree that they'd smash babies against. I lost it, the killing tree. Just listening to that. Yeah. What do you think? Mmm. They're doing like 300 plus people every day. Hello. By the truck. Uh, no, that's you. That's yours. That's yours. Huh? Uh, yeah. more, yeah. You have another? You have another one? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, uh, Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm I, I'm I'm uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. good. That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 One more hand. Well, uh, anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. See you later. See you later. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. ตกตะบายเป็นโตตกตะบายไอ้ตกตะบายไอ้ตกไปให้เยอะไอ้ตกไปให้เยอะอะไรนะก่อนไอ้มาจอยไอ้ตกไปให้เยอะอะไรนะ
if you made it this far, thank you for watching right through. It's an honour and a privilege to be able to tell this story and we're very grateful that you have spared your time to watch this with us. It's a sad story and yet, you know, we've only been able to scratch the surface on this whole story of Khmer Rouge and the people of Cambodia, what happened to them. If you'd like to learn more about that, you could watch the film, Brother Number One. I will put links in the description to that. It's available on Amazon Prime and some other links. The director, Annie Goldson, uh, has it on her website and there are a couple of other options as well. Um, it'll cost you two or three dollars. We get, we get nothing of that. The film has a huge debt, a six-figure debt, so it all goes to paying off the debt. As Victor Frankl said, how you respond when you've had everything taken away to, from you, you still have the choice on what that response is to be. And you saw him with the confession, talking about Colonel Sanders as one of his instructors, uh, sending coded messages to our mother. Just extraordinary. I'd like to share with you a couple of little anecdotes further to this, if I may. A fellow New Zealander contacted me via email, Chris, said that he had met a Khmer man while he was living in Cambodia and befriended him, teaching him English. Over several months, as they became better friends and the Khmer man trusted Chris, he let it be known that he had met another New Zealander. And it was, in fact, as a guard at Tulsan Prison, and he guarded that New Zealander. Well, Chris immediately knew who that was. He had seen the film Brother New Number One, but he did not let on. He then spent the next few weeks just talking to the uh, guard um, about his experience and what he observed in Kerry's behaviour. He said Kerry was not an ideal prisoner. He said he did not comply. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, put it that way, he said that, you may not know this, but there were instructions, there were rules on how you, for example, were to respond to being interrogated. For example, you were not allowed to shout or scream, even though you're in incredible pain. Now, I don't know how Kerry responded there, but I do know that when he was in the prison from this guard, he said that whenever they came in to bring him out into the yard, uh, to release him, he was on chains, his arms and ankles were chained in irons. He would shout and probably swear and curse. But also when he was back in the prison itself, in, the, in his uh, cell, he would sing. And he would bang against a ammunition container which doubled as a toilet. Um, and he would bang it loudly and he would shout and he would also sing very loudly. The guard described how they are guards, he didn't say himself, but he said guards would hit Kerry on his hands and feet with the stocks of a rifle to try and get him to be quiet. Uh, Kerry responded by singing, continuing to sing, sing, but to sing not so loudly, which the guards accepted as an adjustment in behaviour. <laughs> Just incredible. I, I take some sense of pride from that actually. There's another element to the story I think deserves to be told, and it's the story of my mother's response to what had happened and then what came later in later years. In 1997, after I'd been at the Olympic Games in Atlanta, I came back and put together a campaign to try and win the first ever rowing race across an ocean for rowing boats, the Atlantic Rowing Race. Now, I'd been working on this campaign for some months without telling my parents anything about what I was planning to do. I just couldn't do it. Finally got on the phone to Dad one day and we chatted about it and I told him, look, I'm working on this campaign to row across the Atlantic Ocean. It's going to be an amazing adventure and, and it's a race and I want to try and win the race. And we spoke about that for some time. Then I spoke to my mother briefly and we rang off. I thought that went okay. Half an hour later, the phone rings. It's my mum. I thought, here we go. You know what my mother said? She said, son, you go for it. She said, this could be the making of you. <laughs> oh, clearly she didn't think I'd made anything of my life at that point. Apparently the Olympics wasn't good enough for her. <laughs> but wasn't that the most beautiful 
and courageous response from a parent who had lost two sons, not one son, two sons in incredibly tragic circumstances. And then a third son says, I want to row across the Atlantic Ocean. You know, I, I, I just feel so much gratitude that my mother released the reins for me to go and have my adventures and challenges despite what she had been through as a parent losing two children. Thank you once again. If you would like to join us on Patreon, um, it would be wonderful uh, for the price of a cup of coffee. You'll be supporting our journey, our next major journey. Goal is to get to the Mediterranean, to Europe, to follow our son Finn's journey to hopefully Paris next year, the Olympic Games, in the New Zealand rowing team. He is on path for that. He's in the World Championships team going to Europe this year to qualify the lightweight double skull, hopefully, for the Olympics next year. And uh, that's our next major goal. If you at least subscribe, we know a lot of people follow our channel but do not subscribe to the channel. It makes a difference if you can subscribe to our channel. So thank you again. Once again, we really appreciate all the time you've spent following our journey thus far in this particular video.